Well, good morning, West Portal. As you are no doubt aware already, we've had a few spoiler alerts. We have been preaching through the book of 1 Samuel this spring, and we come to chapter 17, which is a classic. I love preaching passages that we don't often talk about. This is one that we are so familiar with. Sometimes maybe we fail to catch some of the significance of it. But this is a story that if you have ever been to Sunday school, you are familiar with it. If you have never been to Sunday school, you are probably still familiar with this story as it's become proverbial. Uh, a proverbial way of describing an overwhelming favorite and an astonishing underdog. And I think there's something in this story that grabs every human heart. Most of us have some experience with what we might call a bully-like presence in our lives, whether that was uh, a kid on the playground at school, whether that's a coworker in the lunchroom, whether that's uh, an obnoxious neighbor. Uh, there's something about encountering like a mean-spirited, foul-mouthed, seemingly invincible character that just makes us go, I know who I'm not rooting for in this story. And there's something lovable about this kind of boy shepherd that seems too young and too innocent and perhaps too naive to recognize that he is at least an 800 to 1 underdog. I like, I'd like to put $5 on this just in case. But, but who just can't seem to see that he is that kind of uh, not a favorite. How do we say that? So it's a story of a sling and a stone versus a sword and a spear. It's a story of military might versus childlike faith. Of big versus small, of right versus wrong, help me out. It's the story of? Oh, you've heard this one before. Excellent. 1 Samuel 17 is where we're going. If you want to put your fingers in your Bibles, I'd encourage you to do so. I'm just going to start with a few comments about the sequence of events. I acknowledged this last Sunday, and I'll just address it briefly here. It's really difficult to sync up a really neat and tidy sequence of events from chapter 16, where we were last week, and chapter 17. So last week, David, the boy shepherd, is anointed, um, kind of a private ceremony as Israel's future king. Uh, shortly thereafter, it seems in the same chapter, we're told he goes to start to play harp in the royal court for Saul, who's having anxiety attacks. And, but he's described already as this brave man, a warrior, the Lord is with him, and Saul invites him to become one of his armor bearers, which in the ancient world, almost certainly included uh, being the, a bodyguard. And we're left to wonder, and in chapter 17, the, the story of David and Goliath unfolds, and David seems like he's back to being the teenage shepherd who's out of place, even visiting his brothers on the front lines, and Saul doesn't seem to have any idea who this kid is. And it, it's such an odd kind of dilemma. There are people who have reached the conclusion, this is, this is the lengths that which some people will go to. Uh, last week we encountered that awkward passage, the spirit, an evil spirit from the Lord torments Saul. There are those who have concluded that whatever psychological or physical conditions that might have included, one of the conditions was short-term memory loss. And, and then you can read the story chronologically. There are a number of ways that you can work with this. I'm just going to give you one possibility. I think it's the easiest and it wouldn't address all the questions, but would answer the majority of them. I'll just suggest it's possible the stories aren't told in sequence. By which I mean it's possible that David is anointed king in a private ceremony. We aren't sure how and when that'll happen. He goes back to working in the fields. A short time after that war breaks out, he goes to visit his brothers on the front line. The story of David and Goliath unfolds. Of course, Saul doesn't know who this is. And after that, He's invited into the palace at some point to play his harp. Now, today, when people are recording history, if we do, like chronology is one of our driving values, such that if you discover the events are out of sequence, our immediate thought is, how can I trust anything that this person ever wrote? But this would not have been a concern in the ancient world, where chronology just wasn't the driving value it is for us. They were far more driven to write thematically, uh, it, you would record what and perhaps when, but you really wanted to make sure people caught why this happened. And if moving a story a little bit out of sequence helped you make a point more profoundly or impactfully to your audience, you were free to do this, and nobody would have ever called into question the truthfulness of it. Now, I share that just to say, regardless of how you want to resolve the tension, and this is one possibility, but I want to say I think there is a pattern, a theme, that our author or narrator does want us not to miss, and it's this. So I'll just backtrack for you. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul is first anointed as Israel's future and first king. He doesn't know how and when this will happen. He goes back to working in his dad's fields. One chapter later, 
an antagonist or a villain enters our story. I don't know if you remember this. Nahash the Ammonite, who's uh, saying he's going to gouge out the right eye of everybody in the town of Jabesh Gilead unless they surrender. And he basically dares the town to find anybody to come to their rescue. And Saul hears about this and he's, there's this righteous indignation that flares up in him. And he sends out kind of a quick recruiting order and he assembles an army and, and he wins a victory. And God's anointing. So here's the, just that quick reminder. That anointing oil we said is symbolic of God's spirit, his presence, and his power. What happens privately is confirmed publicly. And so if people, the community, wanted to say, does God's spirit, presence, and power rest on Saul? They'd say, yes, it does. How do you know? Look, like we watched him defeat our enemies. God through him defeated our enemies. Now watch what's happening here. 1 Samuel 16, David is anointed, symbolic of God's spirit, his presence, and his power, as Israel's next king. He also has no idea when and how this will unfold, goes back to working in his fields. One chapter later, an antagonist, a villain, a bully, if you will, raises its head again in the form of Goliath, and God wins a powerful victory. And God's spirit, presence, and power is now, that was um, conveyed privately, is confirmed publicly. Is does God's power and presence rest on this kid? And the community would say, absolutely it does. How do you know? Look at the victory that we won, that God won for us over our enemies through this boy. And that's why I think in the previous chapter, you find Saul's advisors describing David as, amongst other things, the Lord is with him. How can you make that statement? Because I think this might have happened first. So all, all that to say, that's one way to read it, and it kind of doesn't matter how you want to interpret it. There's other ways. 1 Samuel 17, it's a long chapter. I'm going to read portions of this, and there'll be other spots where I just choose to summarize the story. I'll assume some familiarity on your part and so on. But let's kick it off. So now the Philistines gathered their forces for war, assembled in Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. So I don't want to get lost in the details of where this happened. Quick reminder, the Philistines are a people group that resides on the southwestern coastal plains of Palestine. And they are Israel's primary enemy for about 200 years. And war continually skirmishes and otherwise intermittently break out between these two groups. Where this happens is less important than how it happens. Uh, and the Valley of Elah is a large canyon. Uh, with what Israelites would call mountains. If you think in British Columbia terms, that will be misleading. But think large hills on both sides. And so the Philistines set up camp, their battle lines, on the southern slopes. Israel sets up their battle lines on the northern slopes. And you have a valley in between them. In fact, it would have had significant drainage in it during the wet season for most of the year. That would have dried up to a, a, a creek or a brook. And if you're familiar with your story, you'll remember this is where David will later find the ammunition for his weapon. But there's only about a quarter of a mile in between these two sides, which means you can see and hear fairly clearly across this distance. All right? And this is where, as they say, the plot thickens. So let's keep our story going. Uh, I wasn't going to do this, but favor to ask, how many of you feel like doing a little role play here? A little character. You're like, I didn't come to church for this. Here's, I'm going to read the narration, but when it comes to the voice of Goliath, you guys can get your best growl on, and that's your part, okay? Here we go. A champion named Goliath, who is from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was, it's going to say, over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing. This would be about 125 pounds. Some of you don't even weigh that much. This is his jacket for fighting. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves. A bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed. This will be 15 pounds. Uh, assuming the balance point is about two-thirds up a spear, it's estimated the spear itself would have weighed 40 to 50 pounds. Like, I can lift it barely, but I'm not fighting with this. His shield bear went, went ahead of him. <laughs> Poor guy, just laboring under whatever. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Here's your part. Do it. <clears throat> keep it going. Keep it going. Choose a man. Keep going. I think you have a little more.
Then the Philistines said, And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The text doesn't come out and call him a giant. He's called a champion. If we take it at face value over nine feet tall, there is a Greek translation that shortens him to about seven feet, but give or take, if, if you can fight with this kind of equipment, he's a, he is an imposing physical specimen. Now, I wanted to talk about it and say it as one thing, but I wanted to give you some kind of a visual comparison point. And some of the largest, most, most athletic men in the world today uh, are in pro wrestling, by which I mean like WWE. So do you have that picture for me? It, it's kind of small. The, the tallest man to ever wrestle in the WWE is on the far right, that's Jorge Gonzalez, at eight feet tall. And I don't think you'd call him chubby. That's 460 pounds that he carries effortlessly. And just for the sake of comparison, the shrimp that's right beside him in the middle there, for those of you with really keen eyesight, is Hulk Hogan, who stands six foot seven, 295. So at face value, Goliath is bigger than that. Like when, when this boy walks into a room, you, in fact, most of our, I was thinking most of the ceilings in our house are like downstairs or a standard eight feet tall. This guy has a, kick, a kink in his neck just to stand upright in there. You notice this guy. Now, it's easy to get caught up in the physical specimen that Goliath was and the likable, innocent young shepherd boy that David seems to be. But I don't want you to miss, and this is often missed, there is an implicit, subtle critique that our narrator feels is obvious in the text, but we tend to read past it. And, and to cue it up for you, I'll give you a little pop quiz here. How many of you remember when Saul is first introduced as Israel's prospective king, how is he described physically? Not the dandruff shampoo. Head and shoulders taller than everybody else in all of Israel. Now also remember, part of the incentive behind this whole request of the Israelite people is we want a king like the nations around us have who will fight our battles. In all of Israel, who is the most logical response to Goliath's challenge? We read right past this, but you can't read past this. Before this story is ever about the heroism of David, and it is, it's about the failure of Israel's first king to step up and step into his God-given responsibilities. So Goliath issues a challenge. I'll just read you verse 16 here in passing. I'm skipping ahead. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. I just found myself asking, why on earth was there this ongoing stalemate for 40 days? Like, that's a long time to just sit staring across at each other, right? It's like, see who blinks first. I think the answer is, there might be other answers, I think the answer is remember the geography. Both armies are on hillsides with a canyon in between. Whoever in decides we're going to initiate this conflict has to come down into the valley and now will give up the high ground and have to battle uphill against a well-defended position. Nobody wants to make that tactical blunder, and so the stalemate ensues. Here's where I'll short form the story for you a little bit. We'll, we'll catch up. David's oldest three brothers have been conscripted into Saul's army. David, meanwhile, is still back home tending sheep. This is before the advent of, like, text messaging. If Jesse is curious how his boys at the front lines are doing, he can't just send them a quick phone call. Hey, how's it going today? And so David is occasionally given the task of bringing a few rations or what I might call a care package from home to his brothers at the front lines. Kind of like, see how they're doing and, and then bring news back to me. And one of these days, David happens to both witness and overhear Goliath's challenge. And, and I want you to see, I'm just going to reference these two verses. I want you to see the different perspective between what the soldiers out there are seeing and what David sees and hears. So this is verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. Goliath comes out and he insults us. He insults our people. He insults our ethnicity. He's full of yo mama, mean insults, and, and right, whatever. Notice what David says. One verse later. 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We were saying last Sunday, there's that famous verse, you and I have a tendency to look at the externals and God looks at the heart. It's true not just to people. It's true of situations, circumstances, and events. And what David and God see in the valley of Elah is very different from what the Israelite soldiers see. Everybody else sees somebody who's insulting their ethnicity and their people. David understands this challenge has gone a significant step higher. This is somebody who is defying, and James was saying this already, the armies of the living God. Dude, you have no idea who you're talking about and the power that you are messing with. And so David starts asking questions, like what's going on? Who is this guy? How long has this been going on? What will be done for anybody that steps up to this challenge? And he's informed that there's uh, actually quite a package of rewards that have been assembled, presumably over time. I'm going to guess here, I'm, I'm speculating, but if, if Goliath comes out and issues his challenge after a couple weeks go by, morale in the camp, Israelite camp is not high. So Saul offers a cash reward, you know, he's $100,000 for whoever steps up. Two weeks go by, nobody's taking him up on it. Marriage to my daughter, okay, royal family, being in-law, like there are some perks that go with this. A few weeks go by, still no takers. He's, all right, lifetime exemption from taxes. <gasps> Like, that sweetens the pot, right? As a few of you are thinking, how tall is this guy? Oh, man. I, the Israelite soldiers are no dummies. You can't enjoy any of these perks if you aren't alive. And so, but David's asking questions, and implicit in the question is that he might be willing to do this. And so the, the word gets back to Saul, and shortly thereafter, a conversation ensues. And if we have the text, fire that up. Here's where I'm picking up at verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. This kid's got mad skills. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, all right, go and the Lord be with you. We'll carry on just a little. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him, a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic, tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. I can't go in these, he said. I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, he approached the Philistine. Saul tries to talk David out of this apparent suicide mission, but David is undeterred. I, I find it really interesting. Like, this kid has no trouble touting his courage, bravery, and pretty significant skills. I'm not interested in facing down a lion or a bear with modern weapons. Just saying. Then with anything available to him in the ancient world. He is in no way uh, shy about sharing his qualifications. But what fascinates me is that he understands that maybe as great as his courage and bravery and skill set is, that's not the ultimate determin determining factor. That it's God who somehow gave him the victory in this. And it's precisely that frame of mind, I think, and that confidence that, that allows him to think about what it might mean to walk down into this valley and face Goliath. And, and at this point, I always, like, I, I just picture spaghetti western. You, like, you, you know where, like, the climactic scene sets up and the... the the steel guitar is playing in the background. The sun is setting. Every footstep kicks up dust, and it slows down into kind of slow motion as this kid starts to pick his way down this slope. And then this commotion starts to, you know, through the Israelite camp. There's somebody there. People are looking. People are asking questions. Who is this? What might this be? Goliath hasn't seen him yet. He makes his way down into the bottom of the valley, selects a few stones, and now Goliath sees him. And I've got to tell you, like all great boss-level battles in any B-rated action movie you've ever watched, the battle does not ensue until trash-talking first happens. And that, it's front and center in the text as well. And Goliath basically says, how dare you come at me with a child's toy? 
you're going to insult me like this? He curses him in the name of his Philistine gods and essentially says, I am going to tear your head off and feed your dead carcass to the ants before that sun sets. David, David's pretty quick with the repost. Don't count your chickens before you're hatched would be a rough summary. Uh, but it's like, dude, you have no idea the presence and the power of who you are defying. And it's not me. And I'm about to show you. And at that point, and you need the tension because the battle's over almost before it starts. And we're left to wonder if Goliath had never seen a sling or if Goliath just grossly underestimated David's proficiency and his accuracy. Now, I'm going to take just a minute to talk about this because I, I want to poke a little bit of a hole in the Sunday school version of this story. I love the Sunday school story, but the Sunday school story would essentially say David did take a child's toy and... But for the greatness and goodness of God, he shouldn't. He took a BB gun against a tank. Like, there, there was no chance. I, and I don't want to diminish the point that God gives him the victory. But I do want to suggest David's not as helpless as you think. Ancient slings were not child's toys. Can I just draw your attention to a handful of really odd verses here? You will probably have never made notice of these, and that's fine. You can look them up later. Judges chapter 20, verse 16. Among all these soldiers, men from the tribe of Benjamin... There were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Okay. There's Israelite soldiers, a whole contingent of them, with a tremendous amount of proficiency and developed accuracy with this weapon. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 25 tells of a group of men armed with slings who attack a town. And 1 Chronicles chapter 12 tells of a group of warriors, by the way, who come to join David. Chronicles overlaps with the story of Samuel. Says this, they were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right or left handed. They were kinsmen from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, baseball season is, is in full swing here. Most of you, if you've ever watched a, a pitcher, you have some idea of the velocity that a professional athlete, simply with the torque on their arm, is able to generate. And pretty standard major league fastball, right around 90 miles an hour. Now, a sling, and somebody actually lent me this this morning, which is great. Fortunately, they did not give me any ammunition, because somebody would get hurt. But an ancient sling adds about two feet to the torque and the extension on your arm. Right? In fact, and I found this interesting, before the development or the invention of the compound bow, slings were considered on par with arrows as range and military weapons. In fact, little did we know, you can sling a stone underhand further than you can shoot an arrow. And an arrow, check this out, needs to penetrate the defenses or the armor to inflict damage. But a stone doesn't. That force transfers, and it can break bones and do all sorts of fatal things through the armor. All right? Now, ancient sling stones, not pebbles. Think golf ball. And that's probably a little on the small side. Billiard ball, tennis ball, rounded would be a little bit closer. Okay? Uh, my side story, uh, my nephew, who's like in his like early teenage years, uh, has taken up golfing. He was out with some friends, and he shanked a tee shot, went to go pick up his golf ball, and without looking, hustled back across the fairway just as one of his buddies teed off, hit him in the head. I, and he's okay. <laughs> I know he's some really great pictures. And, and there was a mild skull fracture just with amateur people teeing off with a golf ball. Now, velocity. It is estimated that on the low end, this generates 60 miles per hour of velocity. That's highway speed for us. Any of you interested in uh, encountering a golf ball or billiard ball at highway speed? And there's no reason not to think with proficiency that you should be able to do with this everything that a professional athlete can at least do with their hand. So think 90 to 100 miles per hour. Goliath might have been the biggest, baddest, meanest dude, and he might have been... Uh, unbeatable up close but this is one of those classic i brought a gun to a knife fight kind of stories and and, and goliath just never saw this coming uh, and the text will say the stone forehead sinks in if you recollect little sidebar celsius a medical writer during greek and roman times gives detailed medical instructions for how to remove sling stones that have sunk into the flesh of their victims 
So all that to say you don't need mythical embellishment. This is precisely what we would expect to happen. And in fascinating, uh, like all good action movies, uh, it's not officially over until somebody loses their head. And so David adds insult to injury and decapitates Goliath with his own sword. What a great story. <laughs> I love this story. But it does bring up a great question, which is what on earth do you and I do with a story like this? And how on earth might we apply this to life, hoping, of course, that you and I never actually face any circumstance that remotely looks like this one does. So let me layer a handful of pieces together. Point number one, as Jesus followers, you and I should not be surprised when we encounter opposition, adversity, or challenge in our life that leads us, leaves us feeling helpless and hopeless. That following Jesus does not remove us from facing some kind of adversity. And not every giant you face is going to have an actual face. I was at a Christian rock concert a couple weeks ago. How many of you went to see Petra? handful of you? Yeah, it was lots of fun. Uh, one of these classic things about the concert is a musician at some point leads people in a sinner's prayer, and there's always a who just made a commitment to Jesus for the first time, and there's a celebration, and it's a good thing. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, and, and he goes on, the part that always left me a little quizzical is he goes on to basically say two things. A, just want, just want to celebrate with all you guys who prayed this for the first time. Best decision you ever made. I agree wholeheartedly. And basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but said, I just want you to know... Uh, you are about to experience the best version of your life from here on. And I thought, well, hmm, how wouldn't have said it that way? Now, don't, again, I'm a firm believer in what Jesus says in John chapter 10. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. I am convinced that the fullest, most rich, even joy-filled, purpose-filled way to experience life as we were created is following Jesus. But it does not mean or promise adversity, suffering, or trouble-free. Because just a few chapters later in that same book, John chapter 16, in with his uh, close followers, you'll remember this one, Jesus offers this wonderful tidbit. In this world, you will have... Oh, you've heard this one before. You don't see that emblazoned on a lot of, you know, coffee cups as a little gift and pick-me-up for your morning. In this world, you... Ah, I didn't need that. I start here be, in order just to layer the points calibrating in our head and in our heart that following Jesus is a rich, joy-filled way to live, but it is not, it does not guarantee opposition or adversity free. It is important so that we don't grow disillusioned when that, when we encounter something like that. Point number two, and we're starting to layer towards what'll feel more like good news. Don't forget who the real giant is in this story. Uh, now, Saul and his soldiers are fixated on the strength of the opposition. They just can't not see the imposing obstacle that Goliath presents. And they're not wrong. And whatever situation you're, you, you and I are going to face, there is a time to count the cost. And, and, and there may be times when discretion is the better part of valor. But the strength of the opposition is only part of the equation. David doesn't seem to have any trouble. He has a tremendous sense of self-confidence in who he is, as well as who, right? Um, and and like his courage and his ability, also part of the equation, not the whole story. What David understands is that God's spirit, presence, and power goes with him and needs to be calculated as part of the perspective for this. And I think one of the things I want to say here is, in our story, you get these really powerful symbolic moments where Israel's kings are, are anointed with oil, right? We said the symbolism of God's spirit, presence, and power. Friends, as followers of Jesus, you and I have that anointing. God's spirit, presence, and power reside with you also. Which means in whatever situations you're going to have to wrestle with, struggle through, suffer in the face of, or, or, or decide what, what a proper response is going to look like, the strength of the opposition is part of this. What are the best skills that I have to bring to this table? But God's spirit, presence, and power needs to be part of that broad picture that you consider as, as you think about how to respond. Which leads me to the last thing I want to say. And, and there's good news in this. Hear me out. It just won't sound like good news. Not every victory 
is triumphant. One of the beautiful things about Israel's first kings, anointed ones, which, by the way, is Hebrew, uh, the word Messiah means anointed one. Don't forget that. In these early kings of Israel, we have shadows and glimpses of what God's ultimate king, God's ultimate anointed one, is going to be like. And Jesus comes as a David-like figure. And friends, he wins the most definitive battle in human history, on our behalf, it's just not geographical or territorial, right? Defeating sin, death, and evil once and for all. But Jesus wins that victory not by picking up a sword, but by laying down his life. God's greatest victory is achieved in a non-triumphant fashion. And I think there needs to be a caution in here that we're about to sing, every giant will fall. Um, God can, there is no opposition that God cannot um, move through and help you conquer, but there may be times when the answer's no. And I feel confident about that because of the story of Jesus. Here I'm indebted a little bit to pastor and author. Some of you would be familiar with David Platt, but he's fond of saying, we tend to read the story and think that the punchline is be brave or be courageous in the face of, you know, adversity. He said, the punchline is to learn to be passionate about the glory of God. And this is what motivates David. David is not there to make a name for himself. He's not there on an anti-bullying campaign or even to come to the rescue of, you know, the defense of the ethnicity of his fellow Israelites. He's passionate about the living God. And it's the fact that there's a defiant action that needs somebody to step in and correct this that motivates him to step into and step up against this challenge. And I think this means, friends, that you and I can always, and it feels like praying out of two sides of our mouths, but I think it's appropriate. There is always a spot and appropriate time to pray. God, I want your greatness and your goodness to be, to be revealed to pe the people in my, that I know in my life. I want your story to be visibly told to my friends and my family and whatever else. And I want you to be able to do that through my life and through the circumstances of my life. And in this, these places of opposition and adversity and or suffering that I am facing, if your story can be told triumphantly, if, if the way that people, you can get people's attention and grab people's hearts is by giving me victory and success through these, then help me overcome them in Jesus' name. But if your story can be best told most powerfully to the people around me by saying no, then give me the patience to endure, the strength to stand up under this, right? Right? And that humility to choose to be a godly example, even if your answer is no. So the good news in this, friends, if I could summarize. Jesus has already won the most decisive battle on our behalf. You and I have, as followers of Jesus, his presence, his power, and his spirit to embolden and give us that courage, confidence, and perspective for whatever we face. There is no opposition that he can't overcome in your life, but that's not a promise he will, because God's primary heartbeat is making sure that it's his story of love and compassion that is told in this world. That's a hard thing for us to pray, but I hope there's encouragement for you in that. Let's pray, and let's move to close. Heavenly Father, thank you for the story of your greatness and your goodness, of your great love that didn't choose to stay standing at a distance, but crossed the threshold of heaven that entered human time and space in the form of your son, Jesus. And it was obvious that your spirit, your presence, and your power rested on him. Sickness was healed. Demons were cast out. People were fed. The dead were raised. You could have won that victory triumphantly, but you chose not to. Instead, you decided that your love story would be best told through the laying down of your life. And we say thank you for that victory on our behalf. Help us to live into the victory and the power of your story in the week ahead. 
And we love David, and we love the underdog, and we love his courage and and his childlike faith, and infuse our hearts with that sense of confidence that your spirit, presence, and power rests on and in each one of us. And in those places where you would love your story to be told through victory and success, give us that confidence and courage to pray for it, to act on it. And Father, in those places where your story might be best told, through what looks like a defeat or an unanswered prayer. May your peace, uh, give us peace in the midst of that conflict, a confidence that you are with us even when life doesn't seem good. And may our lives tell your story to a watching world. All this we pray with thanksgiving. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.